as you think about technology and society, thinking about all the impressive areas that technology can help against societal goals. So in areas like transportation, in areas like healthcare, in areas uh, uh, like a variety of other societal uh, needs and education. Also thinking about the role that technology's played that's also drawn a tech clash. So more and more concerns about data privacy, concerns about antitrust, concerns about digital divide, concerns about the future of work, and how do we as leaders think about this trade-off of good outcomes against what may be some negative externalities. Now, I can't think of a better guest speaker on this topic than Eric Loeb. Um, Eric, uh, I've known for almost 10 years now, since I was at the State Department, and Eric, to me, typifies really the generation of leaders that can work across industry, across government, across civil society, and really thinking about what are some of the best uh, interests. When I first met him, he was responsible for all of international external affairs for AT&T. Um, more recently, he's been named the Executive Vice President of Government Affairs for Salesforce. And as all of you know, Salesforce is a luminary technology company, primarily in the enterprise space, and has also done amazing things oriented around engaging with the local community in San Francisco, engaging at, at a California level, nationally and, uh, and globally. Uh, Eric has got his bachelor's degree from Bowdoin. He's got his law degree from uh, Georgetown. And let me just say a huge uh, welcome to, uh, to Eric. And let me also just say that for the format of today, we're gonna have Eric share a few uh, thoughts and a few slides. I'll then um, ask him a few questions to kind of get things started. And then we'll take questions in the remaining time via Slido. So on Slido, as a reminder, you just enter in Slido, S-L-I-D-O.com on any of the devices you're using. It's gonna ask for an event code. You just use ERIC as the event code, that's E-R-I-C. And then you can either enter in your own question or you can upvote an existing question. And I'll endeavor to ask the most uh, popular questions. So Eric, a huge uh, welcome and let me uh, turn it over to, uh, to you. Great. Well, Terry, thanks so much. And it's, uh, it's great to be here with you and, and, and thanks for inviting me. Um, and for, for everybody um, who, is, who is watching and going to participate later, I, I wish we could be together. I, I, I love the interaction of, of coming to the class and, and exchanging views. And I'm glad we can do that with, with Slido uh, so that this will be, this will be interactive. Uh, and, and, and importantly, just to, to start, I, I hope everyone here is doing well. Uh, I know this has been, it has been a, a really a unique time in many ways, some of which we'll talk about. And, and I know that, um, you know, the circumstances are unique to everyone. And, and uh, for some, this is really challenging time for, for others. It's been easier. Uh, however it is, I, I hope you're well. Uh, and, I, and I hope that the conversation today um, is, is something that, that, is, um, that is helpful for you. And, and we're going to cover a few things today. Terry, Terry thought that before we get into uh, some Q&A, that it may be helpful if I, I start off with just some, some background, a little bit of background on, on my career. I'll level set very, very briefly on, on Salesforce, just to make sure that you understand a bit about the company. Uh, and another thing Terry thought would be helpful is if I just share some of the of the career advice from a government affairs perspective that I've picked up over the over the it's uh, almost three decades. And so happy to do that. I'll I'll be quick going through it. Terry, if you have questions as I hit any of those, uh, just jump in. Um, as as Terry said, it's been a super interesting career path from from my perspective. I I do lead government affairs at Salesforce now. And that's after about uh, 25 years in the, in the telecom industry, which coincided with a, a super interesting period of time from you know, the mid 1990s, where you just came out of the, the WTO GATS agreement that, that opened up the markets and really supercharged globalization for, for telecom and IT and competition through all the various iterations up to what, what we're facing in, in recent years, which is um, 
some more protectionism and a tech clash and some different views, some themes that we'll get into later. So it's been it's been super interesting. And, you know, a, uh, a theme throughout it all that that I'd share for all the the MBA students coming at it from a public policy and government affairs standpoint is something probably obvious to many of you, but worth focusing on. And, and that is if any of the work that you're going to do is going to have high touch points to regulation or, or government approvals, that regulatory strategy is a core component of business strategy. And, and the two go hand in hand. And, and that's a theme we'll probably come back to. And so uh, uh, whichever side of that um, spectrum you find yourself in your career is more on the business side or more on the policy side, just always look for that interlace because they, they, they fit so tightly together. Um, quickly, just uh, Salesforce, a few things level set. As, as Terry said, it's an enterprise software company. And uh, without belaboring the point, the, 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 the mission of what we are there for is to help connect companies and their customers. Now that's in the private sector. And if you think of what we do in the public sector, think of that as perhaps uh, a government agency and its citizens, right? Same kind of thing with the, 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 the consumer or the citizen at the center of it. And then lots of different ways to understand your relationship. Uh, Salesforce started with that first top cloud that you see, the, the sales cloud. But uh, as the company grew and innovated, we found that our customers were saying, we want you to help out with more parts of that <clears throat> life cycle of the relationship. Uh, from sales, you go into customer service. And from service, you go into ongoing commerce and marketing. Uh, you understand. And the ideal from a from a, a company standpoint and from a customer standpoint is to uh, actually have a, a holistic source of truth <clears throat> or understanding of your relationship with that customer across the journey. Two things that I'll just highlight that are more recent, really interesting additions to the, to the company. Um, one uh, would be data integration and the other would be data visualization. Something you're gonna hear all the time in technology, we live in this just a massive explosion of of data and, and data sources, the question then comes, can you make sense of it? Can you integrate it? And can you understand it for good purpose? That's why we added a couple things here. One, this at the bottom of the wheel, you see MuleSoft, and that's a data integration uh, solution so that whatever data your information may be coming from, you can pull it onto this platform and integrate it and work with it. And then most recently, we acquired a, a wonderful company out of Seattle, uh, Tableau, which is a data visualization company. And that just helps you in different ways work with, and you don't need to be a data scientist to do this. You can, you can work with, see all the information and, and put it to good use. Uh, cutting across all of it is uh, technology platforms, you know, using all of the developments around mobile and AI, vision, voice, interfaces, security. So that's a little bit about what we do. Um, Terry, if we just go to the next part, a very important thing for Salesforce from the beginning, from when our, our um, co-founders, Mark Benioff and Parker Harris started the company is how we do it. And, and this is something that has uh, uh, been from the start of the company was a set of North Star core values. Uh, and this is the prism through which whatever we're gonna do on the business side, we evaluate whether it makes the mark. And there are four core values for the company, and they are listed in, in order of priority. Trust is number one. You probably understand that when you appreciate that what we are doing is working on a subscription basis in the cloud from the start and helping companies work with some of their most important information. They have to trust that we are gonna keep it private and secure, and we're gonna respect their wishes. Uh, customer success, pretty straightforward. We want the customer to make sure they're getting more out of the experience with the company than they are putting in. It's a core tenet of the company. We're organized not just around sales, but a whole uh, part of the company that is organized for ongoing customer success. Innovation, as you saw from the prior slide, we're never stopping. We're always adding uh, at least three times a year. We have complete uh, overhauls of our platform. And a final one, which gets into a lot of important issues that have been um, uh, in, 
a kind of central discussion around stakeholder theory. Again, this has been something from a very early time for Salesforce, and we could talk about examples later, and that's equality. And that is our commitment, not just within our workforce, but within our communities uh, around education and pay and diversity and inclusion and the environment. And um, we can come back to that later, but this how part of what Salesforce does its work is, uh, is fundamental to the company and its culture. If we just go to the last part, it's uh, last slide is just an example um, in a way of social innovation. And this is from the start of the company. This is 21 years ago when, when the company was founded, an entirely new model of uh, social impact and philanthropy was developed and it's called the 111 model. And it's 1% of employee time, it's 1% of the company's equity, and 1% of our product will be um, donated. And you know the joke that goes around is, well, 21 years ago when there were no employees, no revenue, and, and they were trying to develop a product seemed like a really simple pledge to make. But you know we are now north of 50,000 employees, um, uh, it, it, our, our revenue is, is up around $20 billion, and we have this very robust oil product, and we've kept this pledge, and so we have scaled, and our social impact has scaled with us. Started a movement around this called Pledge 1% uh, that a lot of other companies have signed up for and joined. Uh, we encourage when we're doing venture fund investment for the companies that we're working with to do this as well basically put impact and stakeholders as part of the model of the company from the very start. And this is a theme I'll come back to later around the notion that business is the greatest platform for change. And, and this is an example of how you can do it if you just put it into your model uh, from the start and make it as important as your product and your, and your, and your profitability. Um, next slide is just to pivot for a moment as Terry, Terry had asked me just to share uh, a few experiences from my career, and this is the distillation of it. And uh, this could be government affairs advice, it could be general advice, but whatever it is, this is something that I've thought through a lot uh, in, in the work. Uh, I share it with my government affairs team, and these are, these are the priorities that I, that, that I think are just vital to go by. And at the top is kindness. And uh, I think we can all agree it's needed in this world. And it's, it's an important part of doing government affairs. It's fundamental, it feels better, it comes around. It's not always the fastest way to get things done, but it's a long game and it is important. Second one, honesty and consistency. Everybody should understand this, but when, when, you, are, when you are working in policy and you're working with people and, and these are matters that uh, depend on trust, and you shortcut that, it's going to backfire on you. Third item is constant coordination. Uh, this, this can seem apparent, particularly in a time like this when we're all disparate, but even when you're all together, everything is about getting coordinated internally and making sure that before you go out and do your external affairs, that you've touched base with all the different parts of, of your company, anyone who may have a stake in an issue that you want to proceed with. Get it coordinated, get it tight, get everybody in the same place. Have the disagreements that you need to have when you're debating the best approach, but once you have debated it and decided, move forward together. Prepare. Now, you need to not just think about what is right in front of you, but it's a chess game. You need to anticipate what is going to be the reaction when you take an action and be ready for those and have it planned out. Uh, not just one step ahead, but more than that. Share credit. This is a bit about management more than just government affairs, but uh, anyone who has been on a team or who has managed a team can absolutely appreciate this, that, that the appreciation, it drives motivation. Uh, gratitude is so important. It's not just about getting the job done, but sharing your gratitude for the folks who you work with, whether it's in your team, certainly for the stakeholders you work with externally, it's, it's part of bringing people together. Flag problems fast. This is something that may be intimidating to people from the outset. You know, you can find that people want to bury a problem, bury an issue. Uh, in my view, bad news better travel up faster than good news. 
plenty of time for good news. Bad news, you want to know about it, and then you can look for it and you can fix it. If you don't know about it because it was buried, that bad news almost always gets worse. So make a habit of it and encourage it, create a culture where people will know it is safe and encouraged to flag the problems. Next part is super important for government affairs. Cultivate diverse allies, never make permanent enemies. Terry's gonna appreciate this acutely from his time as a diplomat. And it's true whether you're in, in, in a diplomatic space or you're in government affairs, one of the most powerful things when you are coming to uh, a policy official uh, can be when you have um, some, some parties that typically disagree. And if they happen to agree on this, and that is, a, that is, that is in itself all the more powerful, always leave that door open. Uh, no matter how intense a disagreement can be, um, keep it civil find the room, find the places where you can work together. It's, it's super important to understand what you're doing and how to be effective. Next issue, run to the fire. And this is so valuable for, for your opportunities ahead. If you see a problem, take accountability, make a difference. Does not need to be a massive thing, but those little marginal gains, each time you go and you take accountability and you fix something small or large, it adds up. Uh, next. Um, very true now as ever, never stop learning. Um, you, you see this so much these days, and we'll talk about workforce reskilling at some point tonight, but you need to, you need to, you, you can't stop. You know, your learning doesn't stop when your MBA program's done. Your skills have to accelerate faster than the change around you. A lot of different ways to learn. People have talked about the golden age of television. I just say it's the golden age of learning. There's so many formats, so many ways to do it. And, and finally, give more than you can take. Uh, and when you're, when you're doing uh, government affairs work and you're, you're, um, you're, you're working on things all around the world, you know, you should never be transactional and think that uh, you're just gonna invest time uh, in a place or in a person because you expect something back. And, and that's just the wrong way to approach it. Um, just help people. And when, when you're in a position that, that you can share some experience or share some advice, um, help with an issue with no expectation of anything in return. Um, it, it's, it's just the right way to, to go and it's, it's part of uh, being effective over a long time. So um, Terry, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of a wrap of some of the introductory material to start with. Uh, happy to see if you have any questions, any of that, or just to jump into some of the things you had in mind that you wanted to talk about tonight. Excellent. So Eric, first of all, a big thank you. It's a good way to kind of start out and understand things. Um, let me start out with a few questions here and then I'll, I'll dovetail in a, a bunch of the questions from the audience here. Let me start out on COVID-19. Obviously it's top of mind for, for everybody here, but can you say a bit more about how COVID-19 has affected you, how it's affected Salesforce, how you think it may change kind of the new normal in uh, how we look at technology in our lives more broadly? Uh, it's, it's great to, to, to raise that. And, um, you know, your, your phrase, the new normal, it, it, it just picks up one of the most apt sayings, which is the future is no longer what it used to be. And, and that, is, that is true of the experience, this unique experience in time that we're all in, and as I said at the beginning, I just, you know, I, I hope everybody who's joining is well, that your, you know, your families are well, and I, I just know this is a hard time. Um, there are uh, so many uh, important uh, points and lessons to take from this. A, a starting point that I would just observe coming at this from um, uh, uh, being a, in, in a technology uh, space and, a, and as a policy person, that the last month has been the equivalent of a decade in terms of the, the acceleration of use of technology tools and uh, the, the high watermark of what people understand they can do in a distributed environment, what they can do or what they might have to do. And so whether it is even the way we're doing class uh, this evening, or the way um, many people are working, or frankly exposing the vulnerability and the gaps 
of folks who are not able to work or to, to, to educate. This, this has been a such a dramatic acceleration of that. Um, that leads to both some policy observations, which I can share. It, it, it also has demonstrated some dramatic shifts uh, in needs of, of entities, both in the public sector and in the private sector. And you know, for, for Salesforce, it's been a in, incredibly busy time. I, I think as you, you, know, you gathered from my opening, we are, we are very purpose-driven, we are very mission-driven, we, we care about you know, all of the stakeholders we work with. So we, we dove into action, recognizing this is very different. Um, the type of tools of what we provide are, are quite necessary, right, in, ter in order to uh, manage in a distributed environment. And the, the most dramatic need that we have seen has been um, with a lot of public sector uh, uh, groups that need to do critical work for citizens and in some instances, uh, we're, we're using legacy systems that were very premise-based and, and not able to scale, um, not really ideal for collaborating. And you find yourself, whether you're looking at things at a municipal level, a state level, uh, we've been doing things in, in all parts of the world, um, they've, they've needed case management tools to, to understand how are the needs progressing uh, within the state for healthcare management. So that's been a, a huge area of attention, throwing as much effort as we can into helping uh, with these wide range of, of public sector agencies. It may be one of the most important areas of impact we can have is helping those organizations so committed to citizen services to be able to do it in a more uh, efficient way. So that's been important. Uh, in the health and life sciences area, similar thing, um, helping to support uh, healthcare institutions again, similar type of thing, case management and the like. And then, of course, on the on the commercial side, we have a lot of companies that have needed need to dramatically shift to direct to consumer models, and uh, had an ability to work in a distributed way and to reach their customers without their customers coming into a physical presence. And so, rapidly helping these companies and doing so in a period where it's an economically challenging period. So to be able to do some things with some relief to help people get set up and started and, and, and transform their business amidst a crisis. So um, it's been a, a just extraordinarily busy time. Um, also, you know, rewarding to be able to, to be helpful. There, there have also been a couple of things that I start to think about on a policy space that are, that are important, going back to what we said before. And, um, you know, we're in the crisis phase of this right now. We're soon gonna move into the recovery phase. And when you go into the recovery phase, there is an important moment to think about policy and to think about from everything I just described of this digital transformation that many, many entities need to go through in order to be ready for either the next crisis or the, as you said, Terry, the new normal. You know, are there some policies that can foster that? Are there some current policies that actually impede that? And can we go into this recovery phase with a, a set of priorities of things that could be done differently to be better prepared, uh, more equitably prepared as a society? And so, so getting ready for that is a, is a, is a big priority. So, yeah, what would those, some of those, those be, Eric, if you were to talk about kind of leadership learnings here and for the sake of planning ahead, what do we need to do differently and better as business leaders, as public leaders, uh, et cetera? Yeah, well, look, uh, you know, there is a, a fundamental thing in, in many, many areas, and it, this tends to be more on the regulated, heavily regulated industries side or, or in the public sector. There actually are, in many places, impediments to you going to cloud-based services, right? And uh, with a historical preference or trust of, of, of prem-based, and so there's some inertia there, and sometimes just a lot of hurdles to get to get over before some industries. Sometimes it's in the financial services or health services, um, and again, sometimes in the public sector, there's just a lot of hurdles to go through. So I think those are, since these are such important parts of uh, society and the economy, these are, these are places to look at and say, 
uh, you know, can, can we approach this differently, especially given what everyone has experienced over the last month that you need to be able to in, in order to do it. And to the extent um, things have functioned well, you know, you look to how do you continue this and, and build on it and build the security in. Yep. And Eric, in terms of kind of looking at this new normal and saying what things may be permanent shifts here. So on a basic level, working from home, in terms of technology tools, the idea of using video conferencing, you've already alluded to on cloud computing and using more cloud-based solutions. Um, the use of data, the access of data in certain public areas like health, Give us your landscape of what you think will actually be permanent changes or accelerations now in, in technology and our lives. Yeah, well, I mean, some things are going to be uh, remain as important as ever. We'll talk, I'm sure, at some point tonight about privacy and security, right? And those obviously mm -hmm. remain just as or more critical uh, than before we we started this, but yeah, sure. There there are going to be some some trends. Um, first thing to uh, to expect as we think about return to work, when many of us uh, call it left the office or left the campus, it was it was a light switch. It turned off. Mm -hmm. Going back is not going to be flipping the light switch back on. It's going to be it's going to be a reestab, right? Because mm -hmm. we're going to have these these cycles uh, that we go through until you have herd immunity or you have a vaccination. Um, there's going to be cycles of testing. We're already thinking through the phases of that. So um, in, in, in many instances, versions of uh, work from home are going to continue for more than when things start to, you know, quote, officially reopen. Mm -hmm. And from that, you know, there will be a lot of observations. First of all, I think um, to the extent that people had prior assumptions that, that work from home translated into lack of collaboration, inefficiency, you know, you can't count on people to work a full day, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 would, I would wager in most instances, people will find it's the, it's the opposite of that, that, you know, folks, many people, myself, other managers, are making sure that people are putting um, punctuation marks on their day mm -hmm. because yeah. it just, it, things can just go. And I have seen that uh, collaboration sometimes with people who typically work on the same floor is currently even higher, uh, the ease by which you can do things. I was talking with our head of Asia Pack last night who is uh, commenting that in, in historically, if he wanted to do a round of regional kickoffs across 10 countries. That was two weeks of travel, you know, one kickoff a day. He, he can now do five kickoffs a day. Doesn't mean that you don't get together again, but it, it means that you realize that you can be really effective in reimagining how you conduct business. And some of it can be more efficient while being as effective and without sacrificing a lot. So, um, you know, people will have more opportunity, I would imagine, to uh, have, have flexible uh, days when they may come into the office but don't need to. And, and we'll see things like that uh, for sure. I think that's going to be lasting. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Let me ask you the next kind of category of questions here, Eric, and that's on the tech lash kind of environment. Um, if you look at the number of issues kind of being uh, posed to technology companies, data privacy issues, that there's concerns about, you know, who's accessing our data and what are they using it for, antitrust issues, that there's more and more consolidation behind large technology companies, Google, Amazon, Apple, Salesforce, more and more, et cetera. Um, more and more digital divide issues, which you've kind of alluded to earlier, and ultimately future of work, which basically says when you get into things like virtual assistants, um, autonomous vehicles, diagnostic tools in healthcare. The argument is going to go over time that you don't need as many people doing customer service jobs and driving vehicles and in medical care, et cetera, et cetera. Um, where did all of these tech lash issues come from in your uh, point of view? And how do you deal with these uh, effectively? 
it's such uh, it's such an important question and um yeah let's start let's start with the with the origins of TechLash, I, I think, because it's it's been an interesting, call it three, four years. And as I as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, it's been such an interesting arc to observe in my career from the mid nineties, where, you know, the, the wind was at the back of globalization and technology. And then and then it was it was right around the time of um, you know, the two thousand and nine recession when things started to really move in a different direction. And uh, there are a couple of things I think that can clearly explain this. The, the, the first part, which is fundamental, is the, is, the, is the shift in the role of technology in everybody's life and in even the role of governance of society. Uh, and at a time when it was very peripheral and more peripheral and entertainment and hobbyist, uh, it, it has a certain level of of a policy gravitas and intention. And as that moves more and more to centrality of the economy, of governance, of every aspect of, of your life, it's just naturally going to attract, by necessity, more attention. That is the responsibility of, of, of our public officials to be looking at things that are central to lives. And then uh, factor in a couple more things. Um, one is just kind of the origin or starting point of a lot of the technology industry, which was not in a heavily regulated space of living with daily interaction with regulation and government officials. And, and so as this movement to centrality was happening, you didn't always have um, a good dialogue happening of people coming in and say, tell me your hard truths or, you know, mm -hmm. what, what should I be thinking about to self-correct? before you tell me to correct. And, and so there was real lag time in that. Uh, the next thing I'd observe of what drives policy, and this is not only about technology, but it's definitely about technology and it's, it's true for other things. If you peel away uh, all of the complication and all the artifice of what drives policy, it, it's three things. It's money, security, and sovereignty. Now, it may not be always all three of those things driving something, but it's one of them, and it's sometimes more than one of them. And to the extent that a an official feels that um, is is gravely out of balance uh, with one, two, or three of those areas impacting their ability to protect their economy, protect their the security, or or impeding on sovereignty, there's going to be a strong reaction mm -hmm. um, and and the sovereignty point it does not mean it does not necessarily mean protectionism we don't want a party in our jurisdiction but it, it can often mean we want to be able to have oversight or in some instances control and determination of what that is so um, those factors the movement from periphery to centrality and then uh, a often insufficiently resolved dialogue or conflict around those three main drivers uh, is what explains the growth. So I think the conflict in many ways, it's one of those hidden in plain sight things. Um, you, you could see it coming and, 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 and uh, so it's here. It's here, it's real. And, um, and you know, and, it's all the more reason why I think companies have to recognize that in many ways there, there's a crisis of trust and you have to get ahead of that. You have to really, yeah. you have to map out where you sit with those risk areas, right? And um, being very self-honest to, your, to yourself and your stakeholders, are you in conflict there? Should you be doing more to, to uh, prevent and correct and, uh, and and we can we can elaborate yeah. on that, but that's, that's that where I think it comes from. Yeah, on that topic, Eric. You know, business leaders, what do they own in terms of dealing with this tech lash issue? 
it, you know, one argument, it, you know, it's going to go, I think, is that, listen, you've got shareholders and your job in the end of the day is to maximize shareholder value. The other one is, listen, that's kind of a naive, dated view about things and you own a lot more. You also get people that will say that president of Microsoft said, you know, kind of regulate us, bring it on because we want to let you know that you should be in control of regulating us. You have other people saying that's a punt. You own it to regulate yourself and manage your company better and drive the leadership. Give us what you think business leaders own here to get a good, uh, a good outcome. Lots in that question. Uh, L let me start with the, the stakeholder shareholder part. And, um, you know, I'd argue that it is, it's not zero sum and it's not either or, right? I mean, uh, Salesforce, when, when, when Mark and Parker started Salesforce, as I shared before with, with values, and, I, and you can make an argument that our, our values have not hurt us. You can argue that our values have created value. Uh, they've created trust uh, with our employees, with our customers, with our communities, with our stakeholder groups. And, um, and, and I think that in, increasingly that is, that is an expectation. So um, they don't need to be viewed in kind of contra post to each other. They can be in complement. And, and stakeholder theory does not ignore the shareholder. The shareholder is a stakeholder. It's simply pointing out that some of these more systemic issues that you can see in your community or your country mm -hmm. are part of your success. Um, you know, Terry, you and I have talked about homelessness in San Francisco. It's an, it, this, this perhaps serves as an example of how Salesforce looks at an issue. Um, Salesforce is the largest private employer in the city. We're we're fortunate to be successful, and we're we are uh, right downtown, and and around us is a a you know humanitarian crisis, um, a homelessness crisis, and uh, our our fundamental perspective on that is that you you can't thrive if your community is not thriving with you. So, so we were the only company, this was in November of, of 2018, the only company to argue and, and really help drive a campaign for a tax increase on the largest companies in the city uh, to raise a substantial amount of money to alleviate homelessness. Um, so that's just, that's an example of something that, you know, under pure shareholder theory, you may say, why, why would you voluntarily argue for $10 million of additional expenditure a year? Uh, but if you think of it more broadly, you say, well, it's, it's more systemic than that. Yep. Um, and, and so, you know, there are a lot of other examples I could, could give, but, uh, yeah. but I, I think it is, an, I think it's, I think it's very important for business leaders for certainly for the, um, the, the, the MBA students going, uh, into your careers to think about how important from the beginning of an enterprise that you work on, knowing what your values North Star are. And it goes to the tech lash too, because if you know that your North Star, your values are perhaps issues like trust and customer success, that's a, you're gonna get different outcomes in what you do if your North Star metric is profit. You're going to make different choices in how you run your products and how you, you know, treat your employees and, and what you do for your community. So, you know, that, that North star, that value through which the big executive decisions are run has very consequential impact. Yep. Um, Eric, let me ask you one of the uh, most popular questions here, which ties into what you just raised. Uh, this is Luke Mon, one of my students. You know, it's basically saying, you know, what companies have implemented the 111 model? Um, are they consistent with maintaining it during a bad economic time? And let's assume, you know, uh, uh, more broadly that there's going to be more and more disruptions happening. If you take, again, autonomous vehicles and truck drivers and assume that eventually happens, there's 3 million truck drivers that are out of work. 
are basically is what you're saying that other companies should follow the Salesforce model and needs to execute on it, and how realistic is that? So give us more of the story to the question Luke Mon is raising is, is this something kind of isolated to Salesforce? Is this something that you see happening elsewhere? And if it isn't, how do you get it to happen elsewhere? Yeah, I love the question. Um, and for folks who have a chance afterwards, you know, look up Pledge 1%, uh, which is a, uh, an organ, it's not Salesforce, it's an organization we obviously, uh, really believe in and supported, but it is an organization that 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 helps companies to make that movement to make the commitment. And the beauty of Pledge One Percent is it it it's it scales. It scales with your success, right? So it's a it's a fundamental and and it you know if there's a tough time it could contract with that, but it is a underlying fundamental commitment of how you're going to run your business. And, and what I'd say about it, um, and this is rather important, and it gets to a question that um, I've heard raised as well, uh, it's among your different um, stakeholders, a really important one of those is your, your employees. And one of the things that I observe, um, and I don't think this is just a, a matter of the technology industry, but uh, employees, particularly the, the more recent generations coming into the workforce, are very purpose-driven. Don't just want a paycheck. Don't just want to have an interesting thing to do. They want to know that where they work uh, is a place that cares and makes a difference. And Pledge 1% is a, 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 a built-in way to provide that kind of uh, employee attraction and retention while doing a lot of good as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, check out Pledge One Percent. I mean, there are thousands of companies that have done it. It's, it is kind of a movement, and the ambition is to make it not an exception but a norm. And and this comes back to the notion of business is the greatest platform for change. If you could make it a norm that this is part of what businesses do, that's a that's a huge lift to society, and it's a huge augment to some of the things that that uh, you know government has done or does and helped fill in the gaps. Yep. Eric, say a bit more on this topic about how do you influence other companies to take the actions that Salesforce may be here on the 111, on understanding broadly stakeholders, et cetera. What role uh, do you have? Social is a question also about, you know, how do you encourage other companies to take part in social impact ventures? Say a bit more about all of that. Yeah. Um... Some of it comes back to what I what I just just said. I I, I really do think that there is um, there's 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 a culture shift in expectations uh, from from customers. So if you're a company that is not you know pure B two B, but you you're you're direct to consumer in some ways, customers really care. You know they 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 if and and as I said, em, employees care, and so. There is an increasing value placed on the role that a company has in society, and whether it's doing good or whether it's not doing good. So that that part of this is starting to sell itself. Um, look, Salesforce is also fortunate in that you know our CEO Mark Benioff he's pretty visionary and very willing to jump out there and take counterintuitive steps. That's been a, a hallmark of his career. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he often will lead out and show that you can, you know, take some of these steps um, and, and, and you can have big impact and, uh, uh, and, it, and it's a positive, right? Yeah. It's a positive reputationally. It's a positive for community. So it's just by example. Yeah. So I just saw in the New York Times this morning, there's an article about Mark Benioff uh, basically uh, donating 25 million. Maybe you can tell us more for PPE for UCSF. Um, but do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? And then is part of the strategy there to kind of send a message to others? You know, what are you doing in that same area in your own geographies? Uh, that's great. That's nice you mentioned it. I mean, and that's that's actually a um another kind of COVID example of unexpected things. So uh, to no surprise for anyone on the call, um, Salesforce is, 
is is not a uh, a in the business typically of importing millions of pieces of personal protection equipment. That said, uh, a crisis emerged, and 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 where this started, as the article highlights, Mark got a call from UCSF uh, as as COVID was breaking out, and of with desperate concern of the supply for these, um, the, you know, much needed materials. And um, as a company, we just, we went into action with, with Mark's leadership and the leadership of my colleague, Ryan Ate, to find, uh, source, qualify, go through all of the uh, very important um, uh, coordination points with government uh, on this because, you know, when you're in the crisis, you really need to make sure you are in coordination with emergency management authorities so that you are getting help to where help is needed and uh, not causing any unintended F, um, consequences. Um, so did all that work, but very, very quickly got um, much needed supplies in California, to New York, to Detroit, to Louisiana. And um, this, this strategy was just to help healthcare workers because we could. And there was, there, there honestly, this, this happened very fast uh, and happened very altruistically of just saying, we are, we are in a crisis here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, and people uh, who are doing heroic things are on the front lines and don't have what they need. Um, if, we, if we can help, even though this is not historically what we've done, we're gonna do it and we're gonna throw everything at it to be helpful. Um, so that's that's where it came from. I, I guess what 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 the point that if there's a, a parable from that would just be to say that um, you know for business leaders have some imagination. You can have real impact if you take you know everything you know as a company about how to execute, how to move fast, how to how to get something done, and you put your focus on it. And there's a need. You you can do it and you can really help. Makes sense. Excellent. Let me ask the next question. This is from Christina and there's quite a few people that have upvoted on this. Your perspective on privacy versus innovation or progress through research of collective data. How do you decide on the right kind of data privacy laws knowing there's some really big gains by having access to data and we see it today with COVID-19. But how do you think about that data privacy versus innovation issue yeah great question super fundamental um and at least in 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 my space nothing is more important than privacy so so first thing let me take you back to what i shared at the beginning our north star it's trust right and that always has to be our north star as a company because of of what we do what we are entrusted to do and so anything that we do when we think of privacy, we have to start by thinking of trust from our customers and our customers' customers. And, 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 and that's, that's what we operate on. Um, so, you know, you start there. And when you think about innovation, yes, I mean, of, of course, um, uh, there are gonna be new and unexpected needs but you have to be looking at things from a privacy by design standpoint. Now, on, on a policy front, there's something really important to think about, and that's where, where we are looking at this from a United States perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a really important set of months and years ahead because we don't have a national privacy framework, and we really do need one. Now, we, we have. Um, we have uh, uh, the California you know, Consumer Privacy Act. We have the CCPA. The, the challenge here is that we have a risk in the United States of a patchwork of inconsistent privacy laws. And that is a challenge for consumers and it's a challenge for businesses because then you may not know exactly what your level of privacy protection is depending on what zip code you're in at the time. Um, that doesn't really serve consumers well, it doesn't serve businesses well, it doesn't serve innovation well, because it's not scale. Uh, 
one of the things that has been a strength of GDPR in Europe, and there are, of course, things in GDPR that can be optimized, need to be optimized, but a strength is that it is consistent across the member states. So there's, there's, there's scale and some predictability to that. And in, in the US, we would really benefit from that. And that's something that um, really has to come from a federal law. So we're, we're proponents of that. We have been for, for a while. I mean, the most important things to think about with a, a privacy policy are you know, transparency and control, um, you know, data minimization, uh, and then very importantly, accountability. Right, that that parties are accountability for the compliance with what they're say say they're going to do, but um, you, you know having 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 that predictability and that consistency in place um, really does help people. It even helps on the innovation because you know what your goalposts are. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Another question, Eric, is from Ariel, and again, uh, voted up by a lot. Um, um, how do you recommend business leaders without backgrounds in law and government best acquaint themselves with public policy issues impacting their business? Ah, uh, that's a great that's a great question. So a lot of a lot of different ways to to approach that. Uh, first of all, uh, find a friend or a colleague who's in the public policy space. Uh, we love to talk. I always have to, and it's a. It's actually. I, I say it in jest, but it's not. Um, as, as I as I opened up by saying that that regulatory strategy is business strategy. You know, as part of your networking and just part of your 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 your, your social network, or when you get into the business field, um, really do do find you know uh, create acquaintances with people on the public policy side. It will bring ideas in. It'll it'll strengthen both, you know, in both mm -hmm. directions. Um, that's obviously a way. Second thing that I, I come back to, you know, as I said, one of my top things is never stop learning. This is the golden age of learning, and everybody learns in a different way. Some people are going to learn well from a podcast. Some people have to be hands on. Some people can do a, a Coursera course. There are so many options literally at your fingertips or your thumb tips to find, you know, a course, a podcast, a whatever, um, find the one that works for you. Uh, you know, a great kind of tech and public policy podcast, Recode with Kara Swisher, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. listen to it, find, find what you want. There, there are all kinds of resources out there. Excellent. Good, good. Another question, this is actually from Justin, who's a prospective Anderson admit. Hopefully our admissions group is listening to this one. Um, what are the top skills post-COVID-19 um, leaders should have to, to arm themselves with? So what, what are some of those most important leadership skills? How should people be thinking about interviews? All that in relation to the environment we're in with, uh, with COVID-19. So again, you know, we're going to have different phases. We're in crisis. We're going to move to recovery. Uh, I, I'd say that in in crisis, um, um, empathy and over communication uh, are have been so important. I can't stress enough. You know, appreciating that everybody that you work with has has their own situation and their own challenges, and and it's real right and if you're kind of working from whatever your assumption was of day minus zero and you're not taking into account that you know some person may have a ton of time and they have a great workspace and another person has you know two kids that they're trying to homeschool uh with two you know in a in a in, a, in small quarters etc you know empathy flexibility, rebalance and pivot for yourself, be flexible and, and, and hope for flexibility in the people you work with to be able to move around and reshift loads. Um, communication, over communication. Uh, this is a time to really know, you know, what's, what's going on with people. What are their needs? What, what is changing? What do you just have to do differently? What were the things that you planned on doing before that are no longer relevant that you can just put aside and, and re-pivot to, 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 to what is ahead? 
and then um, a real attuned sense for you know where is the future and where are the opportunities. Um, there are going to be whether it's on a technology side or just business model side, as with anything, there's going to be innovation and entrepreneurship to adjust to this new normal. Mm -hmm. And the things that are needed and the tools that are needed are not the same as what was needed a month ago. Um, you know, one of the great examples I heard this morning of, of a, just a technology accelerator, you know, voice user interfaces. Mm -hmm. People aren't going to want to touch things as much as they did before. Right. 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 So, you know, that acceleration from, from the graphic user interface, the voice user interface, I use it as just an example. But um, a, a fluid mind, a beginner's mind to what is new and what is ahead and not being stuck in uh, the, the practices of a month, a month ago, yeah. super important. Eric, let me drill down one more uh, question on this leadership issue, because we're seeing it seems like such differing leadership styles with COVID-19. You look at the states in the U.S. and they've taken very different positions, how people are either using information or not in making decisions. When you look globally, you know, very different approaches you see in South Korea and China than you see in Europe with COVID-19 and you see in the U.S. Is there any message on leadership about how we should kind of inform better leadership here? Um, well, look, uh and this is a very tough time, but uh, safety first, right? Safety first and, and information driven. A um, uh, lot of people are uncertain, scared, going into uncharted territory. Um, with leadership, uh, it's, it's okay to be, uh, to, to, be, to be vulnerable and to acknowledge what you don't know. Um, to make good choices are safe choices and stable choices and recognizing that this is going to be a, a long-term undulating process, you do need to have good information mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, uh, and, then, and then to be you know, transparent and also receptive to that. And, and I find certainly uh, when I think about and I look at what as a company what we're doing, uh, our leadership team has been holding on a weekly basis an all-hands call for you know the 50,000 plus people of the mm -hmm. company to just be in communication and to share what we know, what we don't know, what we're learning, where things are going, um, and, and then to you know to provide some supplemental services to help people out. So on different scales, I think those are those are just critical parts of this. Excellent. So before I do a wrap up, Eric, let me ask you one final question for everybody here. What advice, knowing the people you've got on the, on the phone here, on the, on the Zoom call here, that are rising leaders and many of them are already into their careers, et cetera, what advice would you give to, to everybody here? Well, you know, there, there are some components from my, my top 10 list that, that we, could, we could go through. But um, really, I, I come back to this as, as you're, you're finishing up your MBA, you're going into your business careers. Uh, the point I said before, values create value. Just hold on to that. Mm -hmm. Hold on to that. As you're, as you're building an organization, you're, 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 you're building a company, you're an entrepreneur, whatever, wherever you're going in, understand what, really think through what, are your values and what is your north star and what do you want to build around that and that will become the culture that you drive and it's a conscious decision don't let it become something you just fall into make it a conscious priority mm -hmm. and it, it will it will shape uh, much that follows from it yeah well said Eric, let me, let me do, I always like to do kind of a, a wrap up with my own takeaways of uh, the kind of key points you, you made, and I'll give you a chance to upgrade it as, uh, as appropriate. I took away four items here. Um, the first one is just this idea of COVID-19, and we're in a crisis mode right now, but we need to be getting eventually into a policy mode, which is what are the learnings and how do we drive a better outcome to kind of 
learn from all of this. That's kind of the first one, which can be analogous to a lot of situations that are difficult that we as individuals go through, that companies go through, et cetera. Second point I took away is to think about the role of technology, that it fundamentally has got a much bigger role. And if we're gonna think that people are all gonna say, this is all great and it's fine, it's not gonna happen because the invasiveness and the impact of technology is greater. And we all need to be engaged in the, these public discussions that are gonna happen that are tech lash oriented, et cetera. The third point I took away from you is this idea that stakeholders and shareholders can be aligned, your focus on those. It's not a mutually exclusive thing. You haven't failed in one. Um, you can focus on, uh, on both of them. And the last point, which is probably the most prominent one, is this idea about know your North Star. Know what's important to you, your values, and you already kind of alluded to it in your, in your last comment here about safety first and info driven. Those are very much kind of core to how a company might operate or a leader might operate if it was part of their values. But know what that North Star is and don't let yourself veer off of that based on some specific thing happening at the moment. Is that a fair summary in your mind, Eric, of the, the key points? That's, that's great. That, that's fantastic. And uh, th yeah, the only thing I would add to it was uh, the point that we talked about, which is that uh, regulatory strategy is a core part of business strategy. So your points and then that, that part, because I have to make a plug for government affairs uh, to have a, a seat at the table uh, as, a, as, a last, as a last point. So, uh, so I've done that. You, you may also get a bunch of resumes now. I think that was a great opening. So remember UCLA. Um, Eric, listen, a huge thank you. Thank you for taking the time on this. And for all the people that have been sitting on this, Eric has been so thoughtful about the points he wanted to share and understand the interests of the students and all that. And I can't thank you enough for your thoughtfulness on this, your time with us, and helping everybody on their, uh, on their leadership journey. Be well, be safe, and again, Eric, a big, uh, big thank you. Thanks so much, Terry, and to, to, to everybody listening as well. I hope everybody's well. Terry, I'll look forward to seeing you in San Francisco as soon as I can get back there. I look forward to it. You guys take care, everybody. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. Cheers.